Introduction. Max Silverman. All he'd ever wanted from earliest childhood on was to be free, not black, not even white, just on his own and free. Nos fresh de couleur. Ja, qua un toy, hum, copyright 2012, Manchester University Press. All rights reserved. Franz Fanon's Beau Noir, Masque Longs was published by the Paris-based publishing house editions de Sueil in 1952, when Fanon was 27. At the time of writing, Fanon, born in the French Overseas Department of Martinique, was studying medicine in Lyons. Peau Noir was his first work, apart from an essay published the previous year in the journal Esprit under the title L'Experience VQ de Noir, which with only one minor change would become Chapter 5 of Peau Noir. Obscurity. However, since the 1980s, the text has become known, at least in the Anglophone world, as one of the most important anti-colonial and anti-racist works in the post-war period. Ironically, given its specifically Francophone context, the text has not received the same treatment in France or the Francophone world and remains a relatively minor work. In his recent biography of Fanon, David Macy, one of the contributors to this collection, comments on and takes issue with this rather strange posthumous trajectory of man and work. He notes the way in which, since his death in December 1961, Fanon has first been adopted as the third world champion of the wretched of the earth, then celebrated as one of the inspirations to the black power movement in America in the 1960s, and more recently, established as an icon of theorists of cultural and post-colonial studies in the T. Anglophone Academy and absorbed into their more textual preoccupations with identity and sexual and racial politic to Macy, also criticizes the way in which the American translation of Peau Noir in 1967 dislocates Fanon from a Francophone context and through mistranslation, transforms him into the archetypal Negro from the American Deep South. Many readers of Peau Noir in English, whose only acquaintance with the text is via this version, have little or no access to the multi-layered Francophone context within which Fanon's ideas evolved. To counter these simplified representations of Fanon, Macy's biography retrieves the complexity of the man and his work, especially the geographical, historical, and socio-political aspects of his Francophone heritage. I would broadly endorse this characterization of the afterlife of man and text. However, while agreeing that the Anglophone post-colonial appropriation of Fanon and Peau Noir has often erased important contexts within which the text should usefully be situated, I also believe that the power of the text resides in its ability to travel across the frontiers of place, history, and politics and speak in different voices to different readers. The tension between the specific and the universal is a theme running through many of the essays in this collection. For Peau Noir is about anti-black racism in the colonial context and also race and racism in general. It is about Martinique and the French metropole and yet resonates far beyond those places and it is about the immediate post-war period in which the economic, political, and ideological power of the West to colonize the minds and bodies of others was being challenged by new discourses and struggles of liberation by the victims of that power, and yet still profoundly relevant today when forms of oppression and power have evolved, but by no means disappeared. Copyright 2012, Manchester University Press, all rights reserved, Po Noir is justifiably a classic text because of its breadth and scope. It is far from a simple denunciation of colonialism and racism, and Finan's voice is not that out of the oppressed Negro of the American Deep South prior to civil rights. Peau Noir is instead both an intellectual critique and an existential project and the expose of the ideological apparatus of colonialism and a passionate cry from deep within a body alienated by that system and in search of liberation from it. Fanon's canvas is large. He engages not only with the French metropolitan system, which, through official and scholarly texts and popular culture, overtly produces negative images of the black, but also with the wider spread of Western liberal thought, which more covertly colludes in the perpetuation of a Manichaean binary opposition between the West and its others. Discourses of liberation such as psychoanalysis, the Hegelian dialectic, and phenomenology are adopted as useful tools for prizing open the nature and extent of white oppression, but are also exposed as false universalisms when confronted by the specificities of the lived experience of the black man. Aware of the conscious and unconscious effects of the Western gaze, Fanon's text is a profound exploration of the power of that gaze to alienate mind and body. Fanon also engages with the negritude writers, Lopold Senghor, Aim Xayer, and others, and their challenge to white oppression of blacks. Here too, Fanon's position oscillates between intellectual critique and emotional empathy. The ambiguities in the text that arise from this slippage of languages are further reinforced when we view Fanon's reflections on black and white writings on race in the context of his own unconscious fears and desires. For example, Fanon's treatment of the articulation of racial and sexual relations in the t colonial context, his stinging critique of the female protagonist in Mayotte Capsha's autobiographical novel Je suis Martiniquais in chapter 2, compared to his sympathetic understanding of the male protagonist Jean. Venus in Ren Moran's semi-autobiographical novel, You and Home Perillo Waters in Chapter 3, could be seen as symptomatic of his own ambivalent effective life. When we consider Peau Noir across these different levels, we begin to get a sense of the complexity, power, and fascination of the text, but also its copyright 2012. 
Manchester University Press, all rights reserved. For introduction, inevitable contradictions. In the same way that Fanon describes the black body as an overdetermined phobic object in a white world, so Po Noir itself might be seen as an overdetermined text. Proposing divergent meanings which arise inevitably from the multi-layered intellectual and existential enterprise undertaken. In Chapter 1, David Macy develops the theme of the francophone contextualization of Po Noir mentioned above by concentrating on the specifically Martinican references in the text, which have either been effaced or distorted in my subsequent representations of Fanon. By teasing out these references, Macy relocates Fanon within a very specific space and time and blocks the overhasty tendency to universalize his ideas. So, for example, the comparison culture of Martinique, whereby social distinctions are constructed around different shadings of color, will be in stark contrast to the cruder dichotomy between black and white which Fanon will encounter in metropolitan France. Not only will this difference in reading color reveal to Fanon the unstable nature of racial classifications and their status as situated social constructions rather than natural characteristics, but it will also establish a tension between Martinican and metropolitan culture and history, which is at the heart of Fanon's lived experience. White, for Fanon, is already overlaid by the Martinican experience of the BK. It is his racializing and inferiorizing look, which will be recalled when, in a train, Fanon is cast as the demonic Negro in the eyes of the white boy with his mother. This moment in France is therefore overlaid with another history, the trauma of slavery and colonization at the hands of the white master. The universalizing of that experience of racialized otherness can lose sight of the historical specificity so important to its meaning. Macy's approach also manages to tease out the profound tension at the heart of the text between the desire for a new beginning and the weight of the past. By retrieving the specific cultural and historical significance attached to particular linguistic items in the text, Macy reveals the unconscious traces of a history which Fanon consciously wants to expunge. It is precisely the question of expunging the past which is central to the copyright 2012. Manchester University Press, all rights reserved, argument of Franois Vergs in Chapter 2. She argues that Fanon's desire for a violent rupture with the past and a new beginning rules out the possibility of a Creole conception of Caribbean history and culture associated today with the writers Edouard Glissant, Jean Bernab, Patrick Chamoiseau, and Raphael Confian. The celebration of a mixed and impure culture central to Prolet, with its complex notion of time as mixed long and short temporalities, is antithetical to Fanon's insistence on a break with cultural traditions which have contributed only to the alienation of the colonized. His concept of time is that of rupture time, a new dawn following anti-colonial revolution, the present turned only towards the future, never back to the past three. Although Vergs is wary of Fanon's negative view of culture and has herself more affinities with the Crowlet of Edouard Glissant, she is nevertheless conscious of what has been lost in this switch from violent rejection of tradition to the cultivation of a hybrid past. Today's emphasis on culture and memory has the effect of transforming the politics of anger, revolution, and emancipation into a blander and more apolitical concern with reparation and justice. Crowlitz's culturalist concern with diversity, hybridity, multilingualism, and impurity implicitly rejects Fanon's vision of a new beginning within the framework of a new nation. Yet, according to Vergs, elements of Fanon's critique are still intensely relevant to an understanding of Creole societies. Moreover, we would be wise not to dismiss out of hand older methods of resistance to new forms of oppression and exclusion. Fanon's concept of where to begin ruled out creolization, but creolization should not necessarily rule out Fanon. In Chapter 3, Jim House situates Peau Noir in the context of racism in metropolitan France. Fanon makes a number of references to this tradition, but is also unaware of some previous militant black writing on white racism and assimilationism in France and the colonies. For example, there is no mention of the journal Legitime Defense, whose only issue in 1932 was a brutal denunciation of social conditions in Martinique, and no awareness of the similarity between his own famous. Copyright 2012. Manchester University Press, all rights reserved, train scene in Peau Noir and one of the scenes in the 1937 novel Mirage de Paris by the Senegalese writer Osmane Associ. House cites numerous other instances of political and cultural denunciations of popular racism and black stereotyping in the interwar period in France which constitute an important context for the elaboration of Fanon's own theories, even if Fanon himself makes little or no reference to many of these in Peau Noir. Yet for House, Peau Noir is particularly significant in terms of what it adds to preceding analysis and writing, by contrasting his own lived experience with the social and ideological structures of colonial racism. Fanon was adept at highlighting the gap between the universalist rhetoric of French republicanism and the reality for blacks from non-metropolitan France. Moreover, he was one of the first writers and activists to see the similarities between his own situation and that of victims of other forms of racism. Fanon's comparative approach was not without its contradictions, as it slides between the cases of Martinicans, Antillians, and blacks in general, and both draws together and distinguishes between anti-black racism and anti-Semitism. Yet it added a different dimension to understanding racism. 
Racism had hitherto been conceptualized in France more or less exclusively within the tradition of universal human rights based on the model of anti-Semitism. By drawing together different forms of racism, Fanon highlighted the interrelatedness of the metropolitan center and colonial periphery and allowed for a more complex understanding of levels of racial exclusion. The next three chapters explored different aspects of Fanon's engagement with Sartre in Beau Noir. In chapter four, Brian Chayette focuses specifically on the relationship between anti-Semitism and anti-Black racism. He argues that Fanon's discussion of Sartre's reflection sur la question juive establishes a fascinating dialogue in Peau Noir between the discourses on Jews and Blacks. At times, these converge around a universalizing notion of oppression, the Black and the Jew racialized equally within the European imaginary. At others, they diverge as Fanon pursues the specificities of each rather than their commonalities. Interestingly, when Fanon highlights the distinctions between the Jew and the Black, especially by defining them in terms of mind and body respectively, he occasionally. Copyright 2012. Manchester University Press, All Rights Reserved, Introduction 7, reinforces a dichotomy which is the very stuff of stereotypes so vehemently decried elsewhere in the text. Chayette suggests that despite the tension between the opposing poles of universalism and particularism, Fanon will ultimately tend towards particularism so as to avoid being caught up in the pitfalls of a liberal universalizing of humanity and to emphasize the distinctiveness of the Blacks' lived experience. In a sense, then, the uncertainties and contradictions in Peau Noir concerning Blacks and Jews, which arise from Fanon's attempt both to employ and resist Sartre's model of racism, are resolved in the effort to challenge, at all costs, a Eurocentric universalizing of difference. In Chapter 5, Robert Bernasconi discusses Fanon's engagement with another of Sartre's texts, Orphan Noir, which he wrote as introduction to Lopold Senghor's anthology de la nouvelle poésie, No Gai Indi, Indi Indi Cessa. Fanon's response to this text shows how the white philosopher not only destroys black enthusiasm by viewing negritude as simply a stage in the Hegelian dialectic, a passing phase, a becoming rather than a state, a bit actor in the drama of a white history, but perhaps more importantly destroys the existential force of black experience lived through the body by intellectualizing it in this fashion. Sartre cannot know the situation of the black because as a white, he has not known the black body's lived existence in a whitewashed world. Bernasconi argues then, like Chayette, that the levels of overlap and difference between white and black experience ultimately come down on the side of difference. Fanon's view that l'Europe in Seda and Nassay Paz implies that there is a fundamental gap in knowledge between black and white, which no amount of sympathetic understanding will bridge. For Bernasconi, Fanon's corrective to Sartre's perception of blackness is also a lesson in deem. Differential readings of Fanon's text, the understanding will be different by whites and blacks because their experience as already situated racialized beings is itself different. The text is therefore not exclusively, copyright 2012, Manchester University Press, all rights reserved, about black identity, but also has important things to say about white identity. Fanon's insistence on the very specificity of the black experience should act as a warning to white commentators whose hasty readings risk imposing misleading meanings on his text. In my chapter, I also discuss Fanon's engagement with Sartre and the tension between universalism and particularism. However, my purpose is to suggest that the slippages and contradictions between these positions in Peau Noir are never resolved, but are symptomatic instead of the restless nature of a text both trapped within and at odds with the binary structure itself. I place Fanon's text alongside two other post-war texts, Robert Antelm's Les B, Humane and Claude Levis Strauss's Race et Histoire, which also deal in different ways, with a struggle to redefine the human in the wake of the disastrous effects of systems of racialized violence in the West. I propose that, although none of these works amounts to a fully developed post-humanist vision of man in the aftermath of the war and at a time of the crisis of Western imperialism and ideology, nevertheless, they all demonstrate the engagement with otherness beyond the Enlightenment straitjacket of assimilation and exclusion, which would henceforth characterize the post-humanist critique of the West in the post-war period. The final two chapters of the collection are studies of the psychic, existential, and political dimensions of racial ideology in Peau Noir. In Chapter 7, Vicky Lebeau traces Fanon's treatment of unconscious processes in forming negrophobia. Through her analysis of the famous scene in which a young white boy cries out, Mama regarding Ray Jaipur, she demonstrates that it is not simply a generalized anxiety and fear which, mediated unconsciously through the cultural and institutional apparatus of the colonial order, is transferred onto the objectified black man. It is, more specifically, the sexualized nature of that fear which lends the negrophobic fantasy its awesome power in Western society. It marks the child's transition into both the sexual and symbolic life of culture. For Fanon, negrophobia is the source of his own alienation as he experiences the white's unconscious sexualized fears, anxieties, and desires. Copyright 2012. Manchester University Press, all rights reserved, projected onto his own body and the socially constructed racial myth at the heart of colonialism. 
By drawing an analogy with the murder in 1993 of the black teenager Stephen Lawrence and the subsequent McPherson report, which criticized police handling of the case, LeBeau suggests that the Western imago of the Negro analyzed by Fanon is still present in the unconscious life of Western culture and responsible for racist violence. LeBeau's essay specifically highlights Fanon's treatment of this fantasy as both the child's sexualized anxiety of difference and the cultural institutionalization of racial hatred and violence. However, LeBeau is also critical of Fanon's use of female sexuality to explain the white child's anxiety. Fanon's vision of a feminine sexualized fantasy, in which a masochistic white woman cries out to be raped by a black man, is a problematic understanding of the articulation between anxiety, desire, and racial violence. Fanon's use of a multi-layered conceptual framework for unpacking the overdetermined nature of the phobic object can lead to confusing conflations. Nevertheless, by dramatizing the scene of phobia through the white boy's encounter with the black man, Fanon opens up the articulation between anxiety and racialized object in a way which is still highly resonant today. In the final chapter, David Marriott's point of departure, drawing on Harold Rosenberg's criticism of Hamlet, is the incommensurable gap between being and seeming, described by Hamlet himself as, that within which passeth show. In Shakespeare's play, it is summoned up by the ghost of the dead father. Marriott argues that this is precisely the conflict played out not only in Fanon's work, but also in the work of Ren Moran, whose semi-autobiographical novel You in Home Peril O Otters is discussed at length by Fanon in chapter three of Pot Noir. The sense of black life as haunted, doubled, out of joint as it hovers between the disguises of the white imago and the anxieties of lived experience. Marriott explores the ways in which this spectral logic of racism is dramatized in Moran and Fanon, especially in terms of its appropriation and manipulation of the black man's desire. In the desire for a white woman resides the whole panoply of emotions and neuroses of the black colonized man, including copyright 2012, Manchester University Press, all rights reserved, hatred, self-hatred and masochism, revenge, the need to be loved and to possess self and others, the search for black manhood. In a fascinating analysis of the scene in which Fanon describes a black man crying out the name of Schulcher while making love to a blonde white woman, Marriott uncovers the strange mixture of unconscious desires and neuroses which haunt the black man in a white world. In an equally fascinating account of Maron and of Fanon's treatment of Maron's hero in You Home Perel Autres, Jean Venus, Marriott portrays the anguished nature of the alienated black man whose life and fictions are driven by an obsessive and endlessly repeated sense of loss and absence in their hopeless quest for white recognition. At the heart of this quest is, ultimately, a mourning for the lost object par excellence, the mother who has abandoned the black son to the demands of white law and culture. Finally, Marriott will locate the figure of Orpheus as key to Fanon's own quest, in his black incarnation. This is an Orpheus who must decline an eventual unity with his white Eurydice, but open himself to the tension and difference of his ennui, which is neither white nor black, but beyond the mannequin. Copyright 2012, Manchester University Press. All rights reserved. The essays in this collection situate Po Noir within a variety of discourses, spaces, and histories, and thereby open up the multifaceted and often contradictory nature of the text. No authentic Fanon emerges from these essays, but a thinker who is both of his time and place, and yet speaks to us all across time and place in different ways. Notes. One, the only change is the removal of three sentences in the paragraph, beginning, La Hante. La Hante et l'imprise de moi for a discussion of the different stages of Fanon studies since Fanon's death, see Gordon, Sharply Whiting, and White 1996, for a justification of the American cultural studies approach to Fanon studies, and a critique of the perspective offered in Gordon and others 1996, see Alessandrini 1999. Four, a critique of the Anglo-American cultural studies approach, which like Macy's review of Fanon studies, attacks the misrepresentations of a constructed Fanon, see Gibson September 28, 1999. 3CF, the title of his book, L'Anne de la Revolution Algrienne, which is clearly premised on the new calendar following the French Revolution of 1789. References. Alessandrini, AC, Introduction, Fanon Studies, Cultural Studies, Cultural, 